that it is quite a scary thing to try to raise children. It takes a lot of courage. Uh, moms, it takes a lot of courage to grow a child in your body, to give birth to said child, and then try to raise this child so that he or she does not become a savage. It takes courage. In 1926, there was a crime wave that was sweeping the country. And so the state of Minnesota decided to put together a commission. And this commission was tasked with looking at crime in the state of Minnesota and then come back and bring a report, bring back your findings. And well, back in 1926, here was a part of the findings of the Minnesota Crime Commission. They say this, every baby starts life as a little savage. <laughs> he is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it. His bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toys, his uncle's watch, or whatever. Deny him these, and he seethes and with rage and aggressiveness, which would, which would be murderous were he not so helpless. He's dirty. He has no morals, no knowledge, no developed skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, but all children are born delinquent. If permitted to continue in their self-centered world of infancy, given free reign to their impulsive actions to satisfy each want, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief. Man, this is the kind of stuff they're putting back in the 1920s. You know, you read this and we're like, man, that's, that's kind of harsh. I read that, it's like, it does take courage to be a parent. I mean, come on. It, it, takes, it takes a lot of boldness. And I don't ever remember Christy saying anything like that when she read the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. You know, they don't talk about how, get ready, you're going to get born to a little delinquent, and, 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 and hopefully they don't grow up to be little savages, right? And here's another thing. I heard on the radio a couple days ago that the average mom will change 7,300 diapers during the first year of parenting. That's a lot of diapers, okay? That's a lot of smells. That takes a lot of bravery, okay? Moms, thank you for being so brave. You know, how do you overcome the terrors of child raising? <laughs> hey, kids, by the way, we love you all. How do you overcome the terrors of of raising children, you'll see, you'll see you'll raise children one day. And you do it. You overcome the fears because you love your kids. You love them. Your love overcomes whatever fear you might have. Your love for your kids pushes through the fears and the smells. And next time you start feeling afraid of raising kids, just be glad that you didn't have to raise Pastor Brad. I mean, listen, <laughs> ever since that guy came here, Every week he shares a story about his childhood, and all, I can, all I'm thinking right now is, God bless his mother. <laughs> you know? How much courage does it take? She needs some kind of award for, for this, okay? Just stick around, you'll see. Well, this morning we're going to be talking about courage, not the courage of being a mother, although we acknowledge it takes a lot of courage to be a mom, but we're not talking about that kind of courage. Today, we're going to talk about the courage that it takes to be a witness for Jesus Christ. The courage. It takes courage. It takes boldness. Now, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 1 says that the wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. So the Bible says that the righteous are supposed to be bold as a lion. But in my experience, I don't always feel that way. I don't always feel, I feel more like the lion from maybe the Wizard of Oz, okay, the cowardly lion, but the Bible says that the righteous are supposed to be as bold as a lion, but I get scared, maybe you do too, especially when you start bringing up the topic of witnessing to people, bringing up the name of Jesus to our friends and family and coworkers, you start talking about witnessing and all of a sudden, Christians begin to get really scared. We get, begin to get very timid. We want to be bold. We want to have courage. We want to bring the name of Jesus into our homes, workplaces, schools, and communities. Yet often we are paralyzed by fear. 
And I don't care who you are, the preacher in the pulpit, I don't care who you are, we all experience fear when we know that we ought to speak about Jesus. Even the apostle Paul, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, he says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. If the apostle Paul can say that he even felt fear, he felt trembling then I think that we can be honest this morning and say, we feel that sometimes too. We feel that way. Now, last week, we saw the boldness and courage of Peter and John. In Acts chapter 2, the gospel is boldly proclaimed, and we see 3,000 people who are saved. In Acts chapter 3, the lame man is healed, and a crowd gathers, and that crowd is an opportunity for the gospel to go forth. They stand up, they preach, and another 2,000 people are added to the kingdom of God. And so we see as the book of Acts is, is going through, we're seeing the good news of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom being spread and, and being proclaimed, but then you've got some people who want to shut it down. They do not want anymore, they don't want to hear the name of Jesus anymore anymore. Uh, in the community. And so, Peter and John are arrested, they're questioned, and then they boldly share the gospel with the people who arrest them, the, with, the, with these leaders. And then in Acts chapter 4, verse 13, it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And then Acts 4, verse 18, Peter and John are commanded to no longer speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And in verse 19, they say this, but Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. Peter and John, they were not going to shut up about Jesus. They had boldness. They had courage. Nothing was going to shut them down. And so they were uh, threatened, and then they were released and that's what we're going to pick up today. We're going to find out how all of us face fears, fears of rejection, fears of awkwardness, fears of inadequacy, fears of the unknown, fear, the fear of man can paralyze the obedience of the church. Or we can let fear take us, church, to a place where we can find power and we can find strength and we can find courage. If we want to be Christians who speak the name of Jesus wherever we go, we need courage. Where do we get that courage? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. We're going to see where courage comes from. How do believers, how do believers become bold? How do we become courageous to speak the name of Jesus to people who have never heard Let's read our text together, Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the, the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed... 
The place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Let's pray. God, as we come before you as a church, we are asking today that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit and make us bold. In Jesus' name, amen. So where does courage come from? Courage comes from the Holy Spirit, church, right? When the Holy Spirit fills you, you become bold. And what we see in this text is that the Holy Spirit comes and fills believers in response to prayer. If we want to be bold, courageous witnesses for Jesus Christ, we must become a people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit fills believers when believers pray. So today, we're going to learn how to pray. And we're going to use the acronym PRAY to help us. So I see four things in this text to teach us how to become courageous believers, how to become bold. And I see four things. Let's use the acronym PRAY. P, pray together. Pray together. R, Remember who God is and what he has said. Remember who God is and what he said. Three, A, ask for boldness and power. And then Y, yield and obey. Pray together, remember who God is and what he said. Ask for boldness and power and then yield and obey. Let's look at pray together first. Look at verse 23 and 24 with me again. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. As soon as Peter and John have been released, they were threatened. They were told, don't talk anymore about this Jesus. The first thing they did was... They went to the community of believers, literally they went to their own, reported what the chief priest and the elders said, don't speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus, and what does the community of believers do when they hear this news? In verse 24, here's how they respond. They lifted their voices together to God. That is the first thing the church does when it senses and feels opposition against the gospel, the message of Jesus, the first thing they do is they get together and they pray. That word together means in one accord. They were unified. They came together and they knew together they needed to do this. That word together is used at least 10 times in the book of Acts. And it refers to the church's oneness of mind and of purpose. The church huddles together, unified. They go to God in prayer. And we see their church do this multiple times through the book of Acts. But why? Why pray together? Because oftentimes, we think about prayer as something we do that's very private. Maybe something you do that's alone. It is something that we do that's private. But prayer is not something that is just private Prayer is a gift given to the church that we as a church body are to do together. We are called to pray together. There's threats being made. The response is unified corporate prayer. It is a powerful thing when the church unified comes before God in prayer. John Piper says that we cannot know what prayer is for until we know that life is war. Prayer is primarily a wartime walkie-talkie for the mission of the church as it advances against the powers of darkness and unbelief. It is not surprising that prayer malfunctions when we try to make it a domestic intercom to call upstairs for more comforts in the den. 
God has given us prayer as a wartime walkie-talkie so that we can call headquarters for everything we need as the kingdom of Christ advances in the world. Ah, that's such a good quote, but it's so true. And we think about this, that prayer is like a walkie-talkie given to the church not so that we could call upstairs and say, hey, Father, could you make us a little more comfortable? It'd be a lot easier to spread this gospel if we could be a little bit more comfortable. But prayer is not that. It is a walkie-talkie where we are calling in headquarters, where we're saying, God, we need reinforcements. We need strength. Would you send the Holy Spirit down and fill us so that we can do this task that you've called us to do? We're afraid. Send the Holy Spirit. For reinforcements. It's a spiritual battle. When we come together to, to pray, we feel support. We're not alone in the battle. We experience unity. God draws us closer together as we pray. We experience a richer and deeper unity as we pray together. Together, we demonstrate our utter dependence on God and our desire that he would receive glory and doing what only he can do. And we express our need for God to accomplish the mission that he's given us. When my car breaks down, I don't try to fix it. <laughs> I go to somebody else who knows how to fix the car. When it comes to spiritual warfare and taking the gospel to people who have never heard, we better depend on the Holy Spirit to do that. Because that's not something we have the power to do. I don't have the power to change another human being's life. The Holy Spirit does. There is power in unified prayer. God uses prayer as a means to advance the kingdom by filling the church with Holy Spirit-empowered boldness. That's how God uses prayer in the church. And we see the Spirit empowering the church, especially as they pray corporately. But in prayer, we confess our weakness, and together we go to the source of power and strength. So if we want to be bold, we need to become a church of prayer. We need to become a people of unified prayer. Sometimes we get consumed with coming up with a strategy. How are we going to get the gospel out there? There's nothing wrong with thinking about that. But look at what the church did. They didn't get together when Peter and John came and said, okay, let's come up with a, a new strategy of how we're going to continue to spread the gospel throughout Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. That's not the strategy. The strategy was let's go to the one who has the strategy. Let's go to prayer. Sometimes we get so consumed with coming up with what works instead of depending on who works. And when we go to God in prayer, we go to the one who works. So what do we pray? So we see that if we're going to be bold, courageous Christians who are filled with the Holy Spirit, we've got to be a people of prayer. But what do we pray about? What do we ask? What do we talk to God about? So we've talked about praying together. Now let's look at the R. Remember who God is and what he has said. Look at verse 24 through 28. Remember who God is and what he has said. So they get together, they lift their voices together, and here's what they say. Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Look at the words they pray. They're being told, shut up about Jesus. Don't talk about Jesus anymore. They get together with all the believers and together they pray and the first two words that come out of their mouth are important. They begin their prayer with these words, sovereign Lord, sovereign Lord. The very first thing the church does when they pray in the face of opposition is they remember who God is. They remember who God is. This is how your theology of God 
will affect everything that you do in your life. Because if you have a fear in your heart about talking about Jesus, then there's probably not a better way to start a conversation with God than to remember that he's the sovereign Lord. He's the one in control. Nothing surprises God. Nothing catches him off guard. He's not shocked when people come against you and want you to be quiet about Jesus. That doesn't surprise him. He is the sovereign Lord. He is the absolute master. Nothing catches him off guard. Sometimes you might wonder, why in the world would God put me in this place around this people in this work environment? Why am I here? And you need to begin your prayer with these words, sovereign Lord. This doesn't surprise you. It doesn't surprise us God might put us in difficult situations, difficult places. God is in control. You and I need to remember that there is nothing bigger than him. And if we remember that there is nothing bigger than the sovereign Lord, then we don't have to be afraid of anything. Spurgeon says that the fear of God is the death of every other fear. Like a mighty lion, it chases all other fears away. If we can remember that God is the sovereign Lord, then we can walk in obedience and not be so scared. So the church in unified prayer remembers who God is, and that's going to chase away the fear of man because God's bigger than the rulers and the authorities and the people telling us to be quiet. So you begin with your fear, then reflect on the attribute of God that will counter that fear. In this case, if I'm afraid of speaking about Jesus, then what I need to remember is, wait a minute, who's in charge? <laughs> who's in control? Oh yeah, the Lord is in control. And he's told me not to be silent. God, you are in charge of everyone and everything and nothing happens apart from you. Look at verse 24 again. Nothing happens apart from him. Verse 24 says, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So since God's the creator of everything, guess what? He's in charge of everything. Even the, even the scary things we face, he's in charge of it. Confidence in the absolute rulership and might of God is a powerful reminder to sustain believers who are facing fears of people who might do them harm. All right, so after they remember who God is, then they remind themselves of what God has said. Look at verse 25 through 26 again. Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. The church is beginning to pray scripture. And they're praying specifically Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. And in Psalm chapter 2, that psalm talks about how the nations would rage against the Messiah and how God would ultimately overcome their rebellion. And the early church is watching this unfold before their very eyes because it almost looked like their attempts to shut down the Messiah worked, but all of a sudden, Jesus is alive and there's still miracles happening and this message didn't go away. It was all in vain. The Lord is able to use even, even the crucifixion of the Son of God as a part of his plan to basically catapult the message of Jesus everywhere. You try to kill the guy and it's spreading like crazy. All of these attempts to shut down the gospel are in vain. Verses 27 through 28, for truly in this city that were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you have anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. The church is remembering who God is, he's the sovereign Lord, and then they're remembering, oh yeah, he's in charge of everything that's happening, even people who come in opposition against the message of Jesus. It's, it's all in vain. It's all in vain. And if we believe that and we remember that, that he's the sovereign master and he's in control, then we can be bold, trusting that he is going to sustain us through whatever we face. So the church prays together. They remember who God is and what he has said. And then next, A, they ask for boldness and power. 
Look at verse 29 and 30. They ask for boldness and power. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So what does the church ask the sovereign Lord for? Make us bold. Really, there's only two requests in this prayer. Make us bold and show your power. That's like the two requests in this prayer. They're being threatened. God, make us bold and show your power. You know what's really shocking to me? Is what they don't ask for. They don't say, God, remove the threats. They, they don't say, Lord, take out the opposition. Make us comfortable. They don't ask for that. The church doesn't ask for threats to be removed. The church asks for fear to be removed. Make us bold. Make us courageous. The threats aren't going to go away. Make us courageous in the face of it. In the face of opposition, don't let us weaken. Keep us brave. We know that God doesn't always change our circumstances in prayer, but through prayer, he will often change our hearts so that we can persevere through our circumstances. And I don't believe it's wrong to pray that God would make things easier, to remove obstacles, reduce suffering, but comfort does not have priority over the mission of God. I'm going to just be honest with you. I, I like being comfortable. And it's very seldom that we ever do anything outside of our comfort areas. Those are the things that challenge us and stretch us. You say, you start thinking about telling somebody about Jesus, maybe a friend, maybe a family member, maybe a coworker. Woo, something begins to happen in your heart in that moment. Something doesn't feel so comfortable because all the, you know, ooh, how's that gonna go? How's that conversation gonna go? But notice the early church, they're not praying for safety. They're praying for boldness and power. That's a good prayer request. <laughs> and here's what I found. I have found that it isn't even a literal threat that will cause me or maybe even cause other believers to shy away from sharing the gospel. It's like a hypothetical threat. It's like something like we've built up in our mind that might happen. We're so scared that it's not even a real threat that'll shut us down. It's just this hypothetical scenario we make in our minds that may or may not happen. That's enough to keep us quiet. We need courage. I need courage. And we need the Holy Spirit and power of boldness. We need to be like the fireman who doesn't wait for the fire to go away before they go into a building to rescue people, right? They don't go, they don't wait for the fire to calm down a little bit. Let's just sit there. Maybe that fire will die down and maybe we can go in the building. That's not what a fireman does. A fireman goes into the building while it's on fire because there are people who need to be rescued. That's what a fireman does. And if you've ever heard me preach before, you've probably heard me quote this, but it's one of my favorites. Spurgeon says, the saving of souls, if a man has once gained love to perishing sinners and his blessed master will be an all-absorbing passion to him, it will so carry him away that he will almost forget himself in the saving of others. He will be like the brave fireman who cares not for the scorch or the heat so that he may rescue the poor creature on whom true humanity has set its heart. If sinners will be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. And if they will perish, let them perish with our arms about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, at least let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go there unwarned and unprayed for. Why should the church ask for boldness? Because there are people who need to be warned. There are people who need to be rescued. And the people of God need to be the ones who are at least wrapping our arms around their legs or at least warning them and pleading with them to turn to Jesus before it's too late. So, 
Moms, you're courageous because you love your children. Church, we become courageous when we fall in love with Jesus and we fall in love with the lost. Because love will push us through our fears. What's the worst thing that might happen to me if I tell somebody about Jesus? Well, I might feel uncomfortable, but what's the worst thing that might happen to somebody who never hears about Jesus? Well, they might go to hell. Now, if they never hear about Jesus and believe, they will go to hell. So, but sometimes I cling to my comfort more than that. We need boldness. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us So we pray together and we ask for it. Then we remember who God is and we remember what he has said and then we ask for boldness. And then finally, we yield and obey. We yield and obey. Look at verse 31 and 32. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Here we see the prayer request that God loves to answer. When the church unified says, Sovereign Lord, would you make us bold? Look, here's the answer to their prayers right now. The place is shaken And they are all filled with the Holy Spirit and they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. When God's people are filled with God's spirit, they become bold witnesses of Jesus. And how do we know that Jesus was there among them? Because that place was shaking, it says. The place where they were was shaken. When God draws near, the earth shakes. The word glory means weightiness. And when you see the glory of God descend on a place, things begin to shake. But what I've noticed is that when the place begins to shake, the knees of scared Christians, they stop shaking. We need to be shaken up. I need to be shaken up. Holy Spirit, would you come and shake this place up so that we are not afraid? Give us courage. Make us bold. And so they pray, and then God responds, and then the church steps forward in obedience. They obey. Verse 31 says they continue to speak of the word of God with boldness. There's no other response other than to yield to the moving of the Spirit when he begins to shake things up. To advance the kingdom of God, we need courage and boldness. What does it look like to yield and take some bold steps? So it's one thing to say, we need courage, we know this. How do we get courage? We get courage when we get filled with the Holy Spirit. How do we get filled with the Holy Spirit? We get filled with the Holy Spirit when the church prays. And when the church prays together, when the church remembers who God is and what he has said, and when we ask for boldness, when we ask for it, for power, and then when we begin to step forward in obedience, because we can't just ask for boldness and then just do nothing, We need to ask for boldness, and then we need to go, and we need to take some steps of obedience. But what could that look like? What might some bold steps look like? One of my favorite movies of all time is the movie, What About Bob? Have you ever seen that movie, What About Bob? I'm failing. Exactly. Bob is afraid of everything. I mean, everything. He is scared. I mean, he's afraid to go out of his house until he meets the doctor, okay? And the doctor gives him some amazing, amazing advice. He says, Bob, don't just think about how to get out of the building. Just concentrate on how you're gonna get out of this room one step at a time, baby steps. As we pray together and remember who God is and what he has said and ask God to give us boldness and power, how about we take some baby steps of boldness? What would be a baby step of boldness? Well, how about this? When was the last time you prayed for boldness? How about that? How about we start there? You, you pray and you say, God, I'm, a, I'm afraid, make me bold. 
That's a good prayer. That's a good bold step. That's a first step of obedience is, God, make me bold. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me bold. Number two, how about this? Uh, This is baby steps of boldness here. Pray for lost people by name. Begin praying for people you know who do not have a relationship with Jesus and pray for them by name. This could be family members, this could be coworkers, this could be friends, this could be people at school, people you know. You begin to pray specifically by name for those people. Maybe you make a list. I'm telling you, once you do that, God's going to keep that on your radar. He's going to keep that on your radar. Pray for opportunities to talk to them. We might say, I say, God, give me an open door. Give me an opportunity to tell so-and-so about you. you. Just start praying about it. How about this? Another bold step, a baby step, is to intentionally turn conversations into spiritual conversations. Take a normal conversation, and you, you got to do this on purpose, and you, you, steer, you begin to steer a conversation towards spiritual things. What church do you go to, Right? How can I pray for you? How can I be praying for you? That's a great way to begin a spiritual conversation with somebody. If somebody brings up something, you're you're trying to steer away a conversation towards spiritual things because once you turn turn a conversation towards spiritual things, it's a little easier to talk about Jesus. So turn some conversations. Another way is to, yeah, to ask people how you might pray for them. Another one is to get to know your neighbors, like actually get to know who they are. Talk to them. Invite someone to lunch or dinner to talk about spiritual things. That's a purposeful dinner to say, let's have so-and-so over to our house for a meal, and you know that you hope, you're praying that you'll have an opportunity to have spiritual conversations, or maybe a lunch. Or maybe a bold step of obedience is to get some training on how to have gospel conversations. I know one of our Sunday school classes just went through the three circles. Some of you all went through the three circles training on Sunday nights. Those are good opportunities to train ourselves on the Romans road or just something that I can have on my mind of, I, I, I want to talk to this person about Jesus. What's a good way? The three circles is, is, is helpful. Those are helpful. Maybe you want to go on a mission trip. Maybe just beginning to take some bold steps of obedience to get the the message of Jesus out of your mouth. So what is your step? Let's pray for boldness. If you're going to pray for boldness, let's be willing to take some steps of faith. We pray together. We remember who God is and what he has said. We ask for boldness and power, and then we yield and obey. I love this song we sing sometimes in church. It says, O church, arise. And put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth will stand against the devil's lies. An army bold whose battle cry is love reaching out to those in darkness. So spirit come. Put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant good and faithful. As saints of old still line the way, retelling triumphs of his grace, we hear their calls and hunger for the day, when with Christ we stand in glory. Church, arise. We have the Holy Spirit. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to let real threats or hypothetical threats shut us down. Become a people who pray for boldness. Remember that God is the sovereign Lord. Remember he's in charge. Ask him for power, and then let's step forward and yield in obedience. Wouldn't that be a glorious thing if this would become a Holy Spirit-empowered church that's unstoppable? with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Woo! (laughs) I need it in my life, church. I need it in my life. But why don't we stop right now and pray?